thanks so much for tuning in for today's chat with the Dewey Divas. Today we have Andrea Calhoun. Andrea Calhoun is a district sales manager, school and library specialist for Penguin Random House Canada. She started as a manager in a bookstore in 1984 and moved to publishing in 1995 with a small family distributor and then Penguin Canada, where she's been with the library market since 2006. Andrea is an avid reader and is passionate about young adult books and all genres of fiction. So without further ado, here's Andrea. Hi, my name is Andrea Calhoun from Penguin Random House, and I am going to start off my book club picks with Scorpion Fish. Scorpion Fish is transporting, a story about art and friendship and the weight of history. Against the backdrop of the Greek economic crisis, Natalie depicts Athens and island life with grace and accuracy, telling a story of return at once deeply personal and universal. The author brilliantly captures the post-recession uncertainty and simmering political tensions in Greece. The next book is Well-Behaved Indian Woman. When a charismatic and highly respected journalist careens into Simran's life, she begins to question not only her future as a psychologist, but her engagement to her high school sweetheart. Her mother, Nandina, has strived to create an easy life for her children, from dealing with her husband's demanding family to the casual racism of her patients. It isn't until an old colleague makes her a life-changing offer that Nandina realizes she's spent so much time focusing on being the perfect Indian woman she's let herself slip away. And Mimi, who failed her daughter Nandini in ways she'll never be able to fix or forget. When life begins to pull Nandini and Simran apart, Mimi is determined to be the bridge that keeps them connected, even as she carries her own secret burden. This is a timeless immigration story that examines the differences between first generation and second generation and how the dream can change over time. It's a mother-daughter story about three generations of women who struggle to define themselves as they pursue their dreams. The next is The Butterfly Lampshade. 10 years since her last novel, The Particular Sadness of Lemon Cake, this is an examination of the sometimes overwhelming power of the material world and a broken love between mother and child. An adult looking back at her perception of her mother's illness and memories that have shaped her. Eight-year-old Francie is staying with relatives when her mom goes into a mental hospital after a psychotic break. She sleeps beside a lamp with butterflies on it. And when she wakes up, she sees a dead butterfly floating in a glass of water and drinks it. 20 years later, Francie discovers a desiccated beetle and a bouquet of dried roses and recalls her butterfly memory and tries to make sense of the three memories and what they say about her own place in the world. The question for Francie is, what do these events signify and does this power survive childhood songs for the end of the world canadian author this is a literary novel that uses a pandemic to look at three interconnected lives elliot is a first responder in new york a man running from past failures and struggling to do the right thing emma is a pregnant singer preparing to headline a benefit concert for victims of the outbreak all while questioning what kind of world her child is coming into. Owen is the author of a best-selling plague novel with eerie similarities to the real life pandemic. As fact and fiction begin to blur, he must decide whether his lifelong instinct for self-preservation has been worth the cost. Connecting them all is the mystery of the so-called Aramis girl, a woman at the first infection site whose unknown identity and whereabouts cause a furor. The disease is an, is an analogy for fear. At a time where personal contact can be fatal sometimes, it is worth it. Is it worth it? It reminds us that disaster can bring out the best in people and that coming together may be what saves us in the end. The Secret French Recipes of Sophie Valrex. A French-born American chef, Sophie had one dream to be part of the 1% of female chefs running a Michelin-starred restaurant. Sophie finds herself on the cusp of getting everything she's dreamed of until her career goes up in flames. Sabotaged by a fellow chef, Sophie is fired, leaving her reputation ruined and confidence shattered. To add fuel to the fire, Sophie learns that her grandmother has suffered a stroke and takes the red eye to France. 
There, Sophie discovers the simple home she remembers from her childhood is now a luxurious chateau, complete with two restaurants and a vineyard. As Sophie tries to reestablish herself in the kitchen, she comes to understand the lengths people will go to for success and love and how dreams can change. The Roommate by Rosie Dannon. So Claire Wheaton is overeducated, underemployed, and single. She decides to move cross country to share an apartment with her childhood crush. But when she arrives, she finds out that he has sublet the room to Josh, a charming stranger. Josh might be a bit too, perspective, bit too perceptive, not to mention handsome for her comfort, but there's a good chance he and Clara could have survived sharing a summer sublet if she hadn't looked him up online. Up until now, Clara has been the exception to her family's infamous reputation, but once the internet reveals Josh's profession, he is a porn star, she realizes living with him might make her their most scandalous story yet. They may not agree on much, but Josh and Clara both believe women deserve better sex. What they decide to do about it will change both of their lives, and if they're lucky, they'll help everyone else get lucky too. The White Coat Diaries. <clears throat> this is an own voices story. The author is a practicing physician, and after reading The House of God while in medical school, she wanted to write her version through the eyes of a young Indian female. Nora is finally in resident, residency, but is questioning her future until she meets Chief President Ethan. He starts out as her mentor and moves to something more. But when a fatal medical mistake is made, she has to decide if she is willing to be part of the cover-up or risk her career and future to tell the truth. 50 Words for Rain. The book's protagonist, Nori, is mixed race and the plot is driven by the bigotry she experiences as an outsider in a traditional culture. A coming of age novel about a young woman's quest for acceptance in post-World War II Japan, 1948. Nori is the result of an affair between her married Japanese aristocrat mother and an African American soldier. Her grandparents have taken her in when her mother leaves her with them at eight years old, but only to conceal her. Obedient to a fault, Nori accepts her solitary life for what it is, despite her natural intellect and nagging curiosity about what lies outside of her attic room walls. As a teenager, she meets her legitimate older brother who comes to live with the grandparents. With him, she, meets, she finds someone who will let herself be herself. They form a powerful bond, but when the grandparents try to stop the relationship, she finally has found something to fight for. Spanning decades and continents, this debut novel is about the ties that bind, the ties that give you strength, and what it means to break free. Ties that tether, another Canadian author. Igera writes about powerful, audacious, beautifully flawed Nigerian women, much like the ones in her life. This is a humorous and insightful look at an immigrant Nigerian community in Canada. She explores what happens when complex family and cultural dynamics intersect with the confusing world of modern dating. At 12, year old, at 12 years old, Azir promised her dying father she would marry a Nigerian man and preserve her culture. Now, as an adult, after immigrating to Toronto with her mother, her mother is now helping her to stay within the Nigerian dating pool. But on one of her mother's matches, she meets Raphael Castellano, not Nigerian, and ends up in bed with him. Azir is caught between her feelings for Raphael and the compulsive need to please her mother. Soon, Azir can't help wondering if loving Raphael, Raphael makes her any less of a Nigerian. Can she be with him without compromising her identity? The answer will either cause Azir to be audacious and fight for her happiness, or continue as the compliant daughter. We hear voices. Kids have imaginary friends. Rachel knows this. So, so when her young son Billy miraculously recovers from a horrible flu that has proven fatal for many, she thinks nothing of Delphi, his new invisible friend. After all, her family is healthy and that's all that matters. But soon, Delphi is telling Billy what to do. 
and Delphi's influence is growing stronger and more sinister by the day. Rising tensions threaten to tear Rachel's family apart. She clings to one purpose, to protect her children at any cost, even from themselves. This is a near future horror novel that tests the fragility of family and the terrifying gray areas between fear and love. Three Little Truths. Set in Dublin, Ireland, this is the story of three woman neighbors looking for a fresh start. Martha used to be a force of nature, but since moving her husband and two daughters to Dublin under sudden and mysterious circumstances, she can't seem to find her footing. Robin was the it girl in school. Now she's back at her parents with her four-year-old son, vowing that her ex is out of the picture for good. Edie has everything she could want, apart from, the ba from a baby and the acceptance of her new neighbors. This is a true, deep domestic. It combines schoolyard dramas and neighborhood rivalries with the devastating secrets kept in marriage. It looks at community, female friendships, marriage, and school scandals. Little Threats, another Canadian author. This tells the story of a woman who served 15 years in prison for murder. And now it's time to find out if she's guilty. In the summer of 1993, twin sisters Kennedy and Carter Wynn are embracing the grunge era and testing every limit in their privileged Richmond suburb. But Kennedy's teenage rebellion goes too far when after a night of partying in the woods, her best friend Haley is murdered and suspicion quickly falls upon Kennedy. She can't remember anything about the night in question. And this, along with the damning testimony from a college boy who both Kennedy and Haley loved, is enough to force Kennedy to enter a guilty plea. In 2008, Kennedy is released into a world that has moved on without her. Carter has grown distant as she questions Kennedy's innocence and, becomes a, a, and begins a relationship with someone who could drive the sisters apart forever. The twins' father, Jerry, is eager to protect the family's secret and, fa and fragile bonds. But Kennedy's return brings the tragedy back to the surface, along with a whole new wave of media. When a crime show host comes to town asking questions, believing the murder wasn't as simple as it seemed, murky memories of Haley's death comes to light. As new suspects emerge and the suburban woods finally give up their secrets, two families may be destroyed again. This is a timely look at violence, female friendship and sexuality, and the media, all packaged as a twisty whodunit. The novel feels modern, fresh, and extremely relevant to the cultural movement in which we are living. The Lady Upstairs. The Lady Upstairs <clears throat> is a perfect fit for our cultural movement, exploring female revenge and relationships. Joe's job is blackmailing the most lecherous man in Los Angeles. But when one of her targets is murdered, both her boss, the lady upstairs, and the LAPD have Joe in their sights. The only way out? Pull off one final con. Desperate to escape the consequences of her failed job, she decides to take on just one more sting, bringing down a rising political star. It's her biggest con yet, and she will do it behind the lady's back, freeing both herself and Lou. But Joe soon learns that Lou and the lady have secrets of their own and that no woman is safe when there's a life-changing payout on the line. Yeah. <clears throat> and my last book is The Push. This is a Canadian author. Ashley worked for Penguin as the publicity director for quite a few years until she went on maternity leave and decided to become a full-time mother and write the book she has always wanted to write. We bought it at a huge auction. It is now sold in 30 countries and TV rights have been optioned. It is a tense, page-turning psychological drama about the making and breaking of a family. Blythe is worried when she doesn't seem to connect to her new baby girl, Violet, but she is determined to be the best mother she can be, unlike her own mother. Her little girl remains distant, rejects her affection, and is disruptive at preschool. Is it all in her head like her husband thinks? Is it her struggling in the isolation she feels in motherhood? Then her son Sam is born. And she is the natural maternal connection that she has always dreamed of. Everyone seemed to love Sam, even Violet. 
but when her life is changed in an instant, Blythe has to face the fallout, the truth about her past and the truth about her daughter. This is a novel about the expectations of motherhood, the things we are taught not to challenge and what really happens behind the closed doors of even the most perfect looking families. And I have to say, I read this book in one sitting. I stayed up till one o'clock in the morning reading it. And then I spent another hour or two talking to my 20 year old daughter about this book and what it means to be a mother and the idea of nature versus nurture. And if your child is wrong from the get go, is that actually possible? It is a great book for a book club. This is the book. If you're going to read any of mine, this is the book to read. Thank you very much, and I'll pass you on to the next. All right, thank you. Hey, thanks, Andrea. You're welcome. Yes, thanks, Andrea. A lot of those looked really, really good. <laughs> one of the things that I really, really, I the one that stood out to me the most was the romance one with the porn star roommate. What was that one called? The roommate? Oh, the yes. roommate, yeah. The roommate. <laughs> I know, it's pretty easy. <laughs> I, I'm a big fan of romance, but I find a lot of it written in previous decades and stuff was very patriarchal. You always had that alpha male and like the submissive female, but I find the roles are really changing in romance nowadays. There's, there seems to be a lot more rom-com. There seems to be a lot more of the very strong female characters. Um, I have quite a few even coming up about um, looking at the idea of sex. You know, the idea of like one is a sex positive, um, has started a sex positive company. Um, and this one, and I think it's actually the same author. Um, this author is actually amazing with really bringing it to the female's perspective. Um, you know, you might get the guy in the end, but there's a lot more to the story than just that simple comedy. Um, and I think that that's actually where a lot of the romance um, is going to these days. Yeah, I feel, I kind of, I've kind of been noticing that. So I kind of like it. I love the female power, like, <laughs> yeah. type of theme yeah. now. <laughs> I'm very much, the books I read are very much character development. Mm -hmm. um, and I and I do still read a lot of romance, so I find that um, that's actually building a lot with that, like the good strong characters. Yeah. We hope you've enjoyed the, today's presentation with the Dewey Divas. I'd like to give a big thanks to Andrea and to all of you for showing up to check it out. We'll see you all next time for our talk with Laring. Until then, bye.